the federal government has once again defended its economic policies amid a wobbling economy and high cost of energy. Speaking at the 30th anniversary of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group in Abuja, Vice President Kashim Shetima expressed empathy for the struggles faced by the poor. However, he said that the policy decisions made by this government are unavoidable. He acknowledged that while some measures may be unpopular, they are necessary to revive the economy and attract investment. With fuel prices soaring and inflation at a three-decade high, can these policies effectively address current economic challenges? Let's bring in Adebayo Adewale, a political commentator and former presidential candidate of the Social Democratic Party in the 2023 election. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good to so see you. you. You heard what the vice president said at the NESG. Um, he basically defended everything, whether it was um, the floating of the Naira, the deregulation, and a couple of other steps that have been taken by this government. Do you agree with him that there is no other way out of this? No, I do not agree at all. And that's the problem of poor economic thinking. I'm sure you will remember that when the Structural Adjustment Program was introduced in the 1980s. Uh, there was a chief Olufalai, uh, secretary of the government at that time, who was saying there was no alternative to SAP. This idea that there's no alternative, this whole law of the study of economics is about alternatives. But I don't blame the VP, I blame the NASG. In a democratic society, you don't become a lap dog of a government. When you invite the government of the day to your event, you also invite the alternative view, the opposition. That's how developed democracies have done it. So when the government person speaks first, then there will be a rebuttal. On the other hand, you cannot assume that you just follow the government a hook, line, and sinker. So the vice president, with due respect, uh, needs to go back to elementary economics. The whole idea of economics is to choose alternatives, to choose from alternatives, to make a choice. They made the wrong choice at the wrong time. And that is where they are suffering consequences. And you need to understand that why I have zero sympathy for them is that one, they were the party in power before, and they said that they will continue where uh, President Buhari stopped. Secondly, they said that they understood the problems at hand. Uh, the president said, don't, don't sympathize with me, don't pity me, uh, I, I know what I'm getting involved in. Thirdly, the problems that they said they are solving were caused by them. The inflation was caused by them. The rise in factor cost was caused by them. And the mischief, which they said they were going to solve, which was the subsidy, they've not even touched it on the surface. So these are their own crises. It's just, so it's just like someone coming to the China shop with a bull, and later says he's doing remedial um, operation there. You will cause the damage. So nobody should tell me that there's no alternative. I can give you five good alternatives immediately. Okay, okay. before you go to that alternative, you do know that it's easier to talk rather than act. You know, when you are in the seat, the challenges are more, and it can be overwhelming, you know, before you then go ahead to, to give us quickly. No, what, what makes it different? Alternatives. It is easier to talk if you don't think. But if you think, you will think thoroughly before you talk. And when you talk, is where you will walk. So they have, they have not been thinking. And I'm not saying this just to um, be, be funny with them. Emi uh, Lokon, it is my turn. It's not an economic philosophy. So, and the essence of Kwame is to tell us what you want to do. Dodging debates is not an economic policy. Bala, Blue, Bulaba, all of those uh, babbling, it's not an economic debate. So, they did not articulate what they wanted to do. They did not understand the implications of the decisions they were taking. And they do not have the executive capacity to run a neoliberal economic setting. You can run it, it's an alternative. Are you, are you in, in favor of a neoliberal economic policy? Because there are people that think... I am not, I'm not in favor right. of it. Okay. I'm not in favor of it, but when I'm criticizing somebody who is implementing it, I criticize them based on the paradigm right. of their own belief. I cannot force you to believe in what I believe. But based within the framework of what you say you believe, the, the, if you look at it, whether you talk to Friedman, talk to uh, uh, Milton Keynes, what you need to understand is that the main primary objective of monetary policy in the neoliberal economy is to achieve full employment. They, have they done that? They have not. So that is the problem. So they are not going anywhere. They, they, you can give them 40 years, they are not going anywhere. 
Right. So I, I like the fact that you talk about thinking because what has happened in Nigeria and many other African countries is that it seems we have outsourced our capacity to think and then become dependent, whether it's politically, economically, in li virtually every sector, waiting for other people to think and give us solutions and ideas. How do we get out of that? What we get out of this is that you have to first come to power or the merit of your ideas, not on the number of bullion vans that you can summon over the weekend. You have to support people based on their capacity, not because you become a political contractor and they give you three billion, two billion to go and do media work, then you follow them. You have to say, this person has a vision for the country. And that is why, if you look at the first republic, the most dominant education that people had is the PPE, philosophy, political science, and economics. If you don't have that knowledge, you cannot work for the common good. What you need to understand is that the productivity of a country is tapped from the people who are in that country and from the resources that the country is endowed with. That was why uh, David Ricardo came with all the, what he called cooperative advantage. What does it mean? It means that you plan your economy according to your geography and your history and the vision you have for yourself. So you don't copy holus bolus uh, from another place. For example, look at the CB CBN. He is doing Paul Volcker. How can you do Paul Volcker? Because he is thinking, if I raise interest rates, if I keep raising interest rates, I can fight inflation. So that's what he's trying to do, what Paul Volcker did in the 80s for Jimmy Carter. But the difference is that it wasn't Jimmy Carter that caused inflation. It was inflation inherited from Ford and Nixon because of the expansion, especially because of um, the Vietnam War. So he realized that he had to fight inflation, but inflation was coming from availability of credit. So he called Paul Volcker and said, come on, help me manage it. So Volcker raised interest rate up to 20, 21%. But what did America do? America had uh, contraction. So Jimmy Carter sacrificed himself, lost the election because you contracted the GDP. In this case, what uh, Cardozo is doing in the CBN makes no sense. Right. Because what is driving uh, inflation is factor cost. It is not the availability of credit, yeah, uh, because principally. It, yeah, w when you look at uh, our economy, we claim to be capitalist, but it's really pseudo-capitalism that we have existed today. But quickly tell us um, one, or a couple of, one or two of those suggestions, alternative methods or suggestions you, you said that you have. You see, the first thing you do is that for government, you start from in-house. The thing that government has control over is called the fiscal policy. How much revenue you receive and the expenditure that you make. And that was where they started frightening us from Jonathan's time. Oh, we are spending 1.9 trillion on subsidy. Then it became 4 trillion on subsidy. And they were projecting at the tail of Buhari's uh, departure that it was going to go to 8 trillion. Okay, I said to them, look, don't worry about that. What you need to do first is that you need to govern the subsidy program to see what we are consumption, consuming, consuming and do the volumetrics of it so that we know who is consuming, where is it. Secondly, you need to do a shift where you take the vulnerables off petrol locomotion or petrol consumption. You can do that by uh, having public transportation and all of that. Thirdly, you block loopholes in your economy. If, for example, like I, I, I exclaimed during the campaign, if you are losing at that time 80% of your crude oil to oil theft, what can you do? What can subsidy do for you? And if you look at the uh, compensation and palliative that you have to give by removing subsidy, it is five times, ten times the subsidy. For example, when President Tinubu came, it was around 198. So people are paying 1,005 now. So uh, per liter, everybody is paying about 1,000. So if you buy a million liters, that's a trillion uh, naira. Right. And there's no way people, let's say people just buy about half a trillion, mm. half, a, half a million liters. So every, every day you add 500 billion to the inflation pressure. Right. So you are taking all this money together. Another problem they have is that they went and devalued the currency and had illusion of money. In which case, you will say, oh, well, we used to, at fact, we used to share two trillion. Now we share 10 trillion. But your 10 trillion is not up to the dollar of the past. And if you look at the contraction of the economy, our foreign exchange earning is still stuck at the real value of the 90s. So, which is why I say, why don't you employ the people? Right now, they are not employing people. Right. So they kill all the institutions that can employ people. And they are also not 
making a, a, an incentive for doing business in Nigeria. If you look at global incentive, look at the U.S. What is the incentive? Incentive is availability of credit. Anybody who wants to do business anywhere in the world, you cannot get a better credit facility for, than the U.S. In China, you have infrastructure support. So with uh, $1 million, you can have a factory of $1 billion because the state will support you, everybody will support you. Uh, now, in Europe, why do they support you? They support you with social services. So right. if you hire workers, you don't have to worry about transportation, you don't have to worry about insurance, health, and all of that because the state is taking care of that. Here, the only thing we had before was because we, we produce crude oil, so we had low energy costs. So if anybody wanted to uh, invest or produce in Nigeria, anywhere in the world, they would say, oh, Nigeria, go there, they have low energy costs. So go there. Secondly, because they have low energy costs, you can pay little wages to workers, so you have cheap labor. That's all gone now. Right. Because you, the energy cost is, is you, are, you are now kind of matching with developed world. So what is the advantage so the, that you have? The, yeah, the, 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 the policies are out of sync with your realities and your historical context and, and everything. And they are showing crass economic illiteracy. And that is a problem. And if you look at the way they are even analyzing data, you just don't come out and say, the economy, there's no alternative. You, you put your data together, then you do econometric analysis of your data. And you get a data-driven decision making. It's not dogmatic. If you, if, when you are taking a step, every quarter, you look at it. Look, look at the medium term expenditure framework. They're not keeping to it. There's nothing they're keeping to. Are you, are you in that camp of people that say that we are being held hostage, that the people that are running the country are not even in charge? They're not running the country. They're doing business. Occasionally, they get distracted with governmental duties. But their primary business, they are just business people. And they think, that's why they are trying to run petroleum industry rather than you know, have a regulatory framework. They're not running the economy. They're not running government. They're just trying to, they don't see you and me as citizens. They see us as customers. So they are mercantile in their approach. So they see you, oh, you're a customer. I can get extra money from you by hoarding petrol. I can get extra money from you by underfunding public education. So they're not willing to do anything, and they're not willing to comply with Chapter 2 of the Constitution, which stipulates how governance should be done in Nigeria. What is the responsibility of government? Call anybody in government. They are not responsible for anything. Right. Because the Minister of Water Resources is not responsible for whether you have water or not. The Minister of Education is not responsible for educational outcome, whether the student fail WIC, fail JAM, is not responsible. The Minister of Health is not responsible for your life expectancy or medical outcomes. They are just carrying these titles to enable them to put their signature to award contracts. But they're not, beyond that, they're not going to do anything. You remember that in the past, Lagos had the best water in all the English-speaking world. Lagos. Yeah. Better than London, Brisbane, Ottawa, anywhere. Nobody is giving water to anybody. Before, we had the best hospitals. UCH Ibadan used to come first or second, okay. the entire English-speaking world. They're not doing any of those things. So they are, we have people who are in power, but they're not in government because okay. they're not governing. Okay, um, quickly, before we round up, last question. You ran for presidency. You were not able to make it. It might be difficult for SDP to make it to the top. Have you thought about coalescing with other parties, at least, you know, alliances ahead of 2027. Just a thought that some people might advise that in order for people that are brilliant and have something to offer to be able to make it to run in the country. There must be a meeting of the mind. Power for power's sake is a disgrace. That, you can see what happened to Buhari at the end, fiasco. See what's happening to this bunch who are there now. The first thing you do is meeting of the mind. So if you want to run a bank, you cannot form alliance with those who want to loot the bank because they are two different things. So what you do is to change their mind. I've been talking, going around, sympathizing with them, giving them an opinion. Not that I'm, I'm not against them. I'm against their ideas or lack of ideas. So what we need to do is not that we want to be in government at all costs. I'd rather not be in government than be useless in government. So what we are trying to do is to build alliances of all Nigerians. And if you look at the number of people who voted for the people who scored the, the first three largest bunch of votes, they're not even up to a minority of minorities. So what we try to do is to see Nigerians who are suffering and get them to realize that there's a link between how you voted and who you listen to 
and the effect you have now. And if we cannot have uh, a new realization, even if it is President Tinubu himself, mm. who realizes that he's missing his way and wants to come and queue up behind us, we don't mind that. But I am not going to say for the sake of coming to power, right. I'll go and join people who are driving the country aground. It's better for us to have an alternative to remind people of what government should look like. Mr. Adebola Adewale, great to have you tonight. Thank you very much. God bless Nigeria.